there's forms that you can complete uh, if you want to help out with that. Uh, we want to remember our three graduates that graduating this weekend, Hallie Pippen, Lindsey Lyons, and Nick Basham. Uh, we will have a, uh, we will recognize them on uh, Sunday, June 6th here at Mount Zion. And uh, we will have a potluck meal with that also. So it's been a, it's been a little over a year, a year and a half since we've had a potluck here. So uh, maybe we're getting back to normal. Uh, June 27th, we'll have a VBS planning following the morning worship in the youth center. And I uh, want to remember our uh, VBS July 11th through the 14th uh, theme will be Out of This World. Mm. Uh, also, we want to remember uh, uh, Destiny Walkup. She was baptized here this past week on Monday afternoon. Uh, she's a sophomore, lives in Sarasota, Florida. She is one of the first ones on our uh, bus ministry. And she was here for a couple of days this past weekend and I decided to be baptized while she was here. So uh, her address is in the bulletin there if you, anyone wants to, and her phone number. If anybody wants to send her a card or send her a text encouraging her, uh, please do so. Does anyone have anything else for the announcements this morning? Jerry, do we have a scripture reader this morning? Is it me? Okay. Scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 16, 9 through 13. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Uh, Steve Crosland will be leading our singing this morning, so everyone join in our song service. <laughs> Good morning. David done told us how it was going to be really, really light this morning. But as usual, he he's not good at guessing. He's a good preacher, but he's not good at guessing. First song this morning be uh, page 520, 556. 563, I ain't good at numbers either. I'll join in. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you be evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonderful power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Power, wonder, in power, and the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. 
would you do serve it for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. <coughs> Next song will be page 545. After this song, Brother Ryan Barrett will lead our minds in prayer. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know. I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know He'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, do you know I have no friend like you? If heaven's not my name, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, this world is not our home, and a lot of times we mess up, and we try to make it our home, but Father, we are praying to you this morning that we focus on you, and not what we're surrounded in. Father, it's so easy to focus on what's around us and the distractions, but we just pray that we are focused on where our eternal home is at. Father, we are thankful for today, and this beautiful weather and all that you've given us. Father, you are the giver of all things. You are the one who sustains us. You are our provider. Father, as was mentioned last Sunday, we praise you for being a politics-free God. Father, we've been guilty of looking to certain leaders to lead us in your ways and maybe even sometimes looking to our country to be the answer to our problems, but Father, your word is clear. It teaches us that 
those aren't the answers. You're our king. No matter what we look around and see, no matter how dark things around us get, you're with us, you're working through us, and you're going to be with us. We thank you for being our king. Father, we are grateful for those who are ministering here. We are grateful for Destiny Walkup's decision to follow you. Father, we are grateful for her story and just how this congregation sought to plant seeds and how you provided the increase. Father, we pray that you will be with her in her journey. We pray that she will grow. We pray that she will point those around her to you. Father, we pray for her as she searches for a church family in Sarasota, and we're grateful that she has a connection today to be able to worship with somebody who is from this community. Father, we pray for our ministries here at this church. Uh, we're grateful for those who are serving with the children's church, and we just pray that that blossoms and grows and has impact in this community. Father, we are in all of you as we look back and think about what you've done in our lives. Father, we, we see that you do more than we ever imagined, more than we expect. And Father, we are grateful for that. Our minds can be so small. We can put you in a box, but you continually blow us away. Father, we pray that you will be with David as he presents a message to us today. We pray that it convicts our hearts. Father, we also pray for our seniors in this congregation who recently graduated high school. We pray that you will be with them and help them to be focused on you, and we pray that you will direct their paths. Father, be with all those who are mentioned in announcements. We pray that you'll be with each specific situation. Father, we love you. We pray that our worship is focused on you and acceptable to you today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For our next song, we'll uh, sing page 119, and we invite you all to stand at this time. <clears throat> I might have doubled up on it. I might have sung this one last time, too, but I sent my songs in yesterday to Ryan floating on Barren River, and I just come up with what I could come up with, so it's a good song. Don't matter if we sing it every Sunday. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be us all the day long. While there are others living about us, never Yeah. 
morning and Steve is right about the county but I don't think that's a uh, that's not news to anybody that's here <laughs> I, I never can get it right I just can't do it but anyway uh, like Greg said he hadn't changed it yet but 82 last week 82 again today and we've got uh, a lot of our own people that are out and gone and um, some of them even in other states this morning. So we're glad you're here this morning and we got some of our others back. And uh, I don't know if you had a chance to talk to him yet or speak to him, but Bob Harden is here today and we're glad to we're glad to have Bob back with us and everything. It's good for it's good for him and it's really good for us. Uh, Dan's been here of course, but Bob is with us today, so we're glad that he's here with us. I uh, had a good get together yesterday afternoon down at uh, Barry and Wanda's and uh, got another one coming up already set up in here for this afternoon for uh, Hallie and Brandon <coughs> and uh, looking forward to that as well. Uh, I want to make a, I'm going to put in a little plug right here uh, for our Sunday school class. Uh, out here obviously we want everybody whatever your age is to come Sunday school but uh, for the adult class out here we're studying in 1 Corinthians uh, and it is uh, to say the least it's a very interesting book it's a big book it's got a lot of information in it we know Paul wrote it to the church at Corinth <coughs> and uh, it, it's, it's really difficult for us to imagine in our time today, we know we've got a lot of problems. We've got a lot of problems in our society. But it's difficult to think, or it is for me, to think about how the church was as young and as new as it was at the time that this was written. The church wasn't very old. Uh, most of the people that were members of it at that time, this is... Uh, we're talking about in the first lifetime of a person in the church. Uh, and Paul writes to the Corinthians, uh, and it's a, like I said, it's a long letter, 16 chapters long for us. Uh, and I went back and counted <clears throat> the number of problems, distinct problems that they had in the church at Corinth. And if I didn't miscount, I counted 15 problems. Now, if you can think about the church here at Mount Zion, or uh, like we got visitors this morning, the church where you go, um, having multiple problems, and a lot of churches do. 
<clears throat> I would think the bigger the church, the more problems you might have because of diversity. But I, it's hard for me to imagine that the church at Corinth would have this many major problems as young as it was. Uh, it took a few years to get out of Jerusalem where the church was first established on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and as Jesus had said uh, to his apostles, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what was being done. And we find the apostle Paul uh, making the missionary journeys that he did. And we know that he went all these different places. And you'll notice in that reading this morning that uh, not only did he mention about Timothy... Uh, being there in person but and, and not only that but notice again that he says in verse 12 he says now as touching our brother Apollos we're familiar with Apollos and how Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and taught him the way more perfectly he said I greatly desired for him to come to you and he said he wasn't quite ready to do that but he's coming he'll be there but it'll be in his time and not, not right away. And then, of course, Paul himself, he had this great desire to go uh, to, uh, to Corinth. And no wonder, because of the problems that they had. Boy, did, if there was ever a place that needed visiting uh, by those preachers, Timothy, Apollos, and Paul, it, it had to be Corinth. And I can't imagine anybody else that had any more problems. And remember now that not only did the church at Corinth have uh, members who had been Jews, lived under the law of Moses up to the time that they became Christians, a lot of Gentiles there too. And you got to remember this, that a lot of the Gentiles had been pagans. That is, that they either believed in many gods, in many different gods, or some of them didn't have a God at all. They didn't, didn't identify with anybody. Now they have become Christians, so you've got a scattering of people at Corinth, of course, in Greece. Uh, and as Paul writes this letter to them in this last chapter, he's fixing to sign off. Uh, and you heard what Greg read to us for a few minutes ago. A few minutes ago, he said, There's a great door in the face that's open to me, for there are many adversaries. Many adversaries. <clears throat> well, that's not a word that I use very often. I know what an adversary is, but it's just not a use a word that I use very often. But it's used here in King James Version. Um, another way of saying it: Church got a lot of enemies. Church has got a lot of enemies. There are many adversaries, uh, and I'm thinking, really. Uh, as young as the church is and no longer than the church has been established at Corinth and you already got a lot of enemies he said there are many many wasn't just a little handful I think he really meant what he said church has got a lot of enemies and I think boy how is that possible with the church not how could it already have a bunch of enemies and who are these? How do you identify them? Who do you, who's your enemies? Because I really believe that even today, sometimes it's hard to identify the enemies of the church. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm telling you today, the church has got enemies. The church has got enemies. Just like the church at Corinth. And I'm not speaking necessarily just the church at Mount Zion. I'm talking about the church in general. The church has got enemies. Uh, and so you may be scratching your head and say, what enemies do the church, does the church have? Uh, so that kind of prompted me to go back and to look and see what kind of the church, uh, not only the church uh, at Corinth had, because all of those are outlined, but what kind of church does, uh, enemies does the church have today, adversaries that the church has today? Because I can't think of a time in history that there wasn't adversaries. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they had an adversary. You know who he was? Posed as a snake. But it was Satan himself. It's Satan. And so he was the adversary. 
Uh, and I think about Egypt. Who was the adversary? Pharaoh himself. He was the adversary. I think about Judea at the time of Jesus. The Jews were the adversary of Christ. Now it wasn't because Christ wanted it to be that way, but they looked for every little old thing they could think of to try to get Christ. Sometimes they would send in the lawyers. I'm talking about the lawyers. I remember now that at that time, as far as the Jews were concerned, civil law and religious law were the same thing. Now we got a separation of church and state. But the law of Moses was not only a moral law, but it was a civil law too. And so there were lawyers, and they uh, uh, operated within that realm of prosecuting moral law, uh, sin, uh, as well as civil crime. See, we make a distinction today. Sin, crime, sin's moral, crime is, uh, that's, le that's more the legal thing. But not under the law of Moses. And so what they would do, they would send the best they had, usually Pharisees, occasionally it'd be a, a Sadducee, most time it was. And so they became Jesus' enemies, his adversaries. Uh, and Jesus would be standing up speaking. You know what they do? They go pick him out a lawyer and they say, you go over and ask him this question. And you know how... Now, if you're here this morning as a lawyer, don't take this personal, but I'm just telling you how I see it right here. Notice how that they'll, they'll warp it around and twist it and everything to make it sound like something that really isn't. Um, and I, I said Pharisees a while ago also the Sadducees. Let me give you an example. Um, some of the Sadducees, they came to him one time and they said, uh, Jesus... Uh, <coughs> Let's ask these. Let's ask these. Answer this question for us. He said there was a there was a situation in which uh, um, this man died. Um, now, was it a man or a woman? Somebody help me on this. That died, uh, and then uh, married again. Didn't have no children but a second. Huh? The husband died. The husband died. And had six brothers. Uh, yeah. Uh, and every time, and of course this is under Jewish law, every time he uh, he would marry woman. And never did have any children. And now here it is. Here, here's the punchline. Here, here's where it comes. He said, uh, whose wife she going to be in the judgment? And here's Jesus' answer. Ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the love of God. What a criticism. Man, that, I tell you what, that'd make my face turn red. If Jesus said that to me, I don't know where I could take that or not. He said, because in heaven there is no marriage or given in marriage. That's an earthly institution. Why you're here on this earth. When this earth is over, that's not going to be one of the things. Now, I know there's a lot of people who don't think that, don't believe that, but that's what Jesus said. I'm giving you what he said. And, and, and that's just one example of how many times that they did that. Jesus had a lot of adversaries while he was here on this earth. Even one of his own disciples, we mentioned that this morning, was his adversary. Hand, Jesus handpicked him, Judas. Judas is scared. And he became Jesus' adversary, sold him for third pieces of silver. So, boy, that really opened the door here for some things that I'll, next few minutes that I want us uh, to study. Because, where does that leave us today? Well, one of the adversaries that we've got in the church today is atheism. Now, that doesn't cost a lot of us as mine most of the time, because I'm used to dealing with you and you're not an atheist. And you're used to dealing with me and you know that I'm not an atheist. So that ain't a big deal. Not to us. Not around here. Not at, Probably not at Mount Zion. How many people do you personally know that's an atheist that will just walk right up to your face and say, I do not believe that there's a God. I do not believe there's a heaven or a hell. I don't think there's a hereafter. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe none of that silly stuff that you do. Probably we don't know very many people that's like that. 
But if you don't think that atheism is an adversary of the church today, you better get your head out of the sand. It is growing by leaps and bounds. Atheism has grown 8% in the last decade. 8%. And I'm thinking, where's that coming from? What's happened all of a sudden? And that is all of a sudden one decade. What's happened? That we've come from 92% down uh, at that low in just one decade. Well, atheism, uh, well, they've got this thing today that they call um, FFR. Anybody heard of it? Freedom from religion. Freedom from religion. And, and that's because they think people like us are impending upon their freedom, their rights. And, and I don't know of any of us that are doing that, but they are, they've are they got that agenda, and it goes on and on. David, David's definition of an atheist, as if there never was an atheist until now, they've been atheists all along. David said, uh, the fool in his heart says there is no God. And so, all I'm going to say, and if it makes the atheist mad this morning, this is going out. If it makes somebody mad to be called an atheist, I'm going to say this, and it's not my interpretation. You're a fool. If you're an atheist, you're a fool. Because one day you're going to stand before God in judgment, and your mind's going to be changed at that point. It shouldn't, you shouldn't wait that long. The church has got a lot of adversaries. One of them's atheism, and it's getting worse. Nazi Germany, were, Nazi Germany was atheist. Just a few years ago, Russia, USSR, their poll said that Russia was 96%, 96% atheist. Only 4% of the people there believed in God. Turned out that was a big lie because just as soon as the USSR busted up, boy, those numbers went up crazy. And so that was a big lie. But that's what they said. And there are many people today that require scientific proof that there's God. Faith doesn't have anything to do with it. you got to prove to me there's a God. That's a fool that does that. And that's what David said. Atheism's on the rise. And it's an enemy of the church. Here's one that's an enemy of the church and that's world in this. And boy, if we're not careful, that can get every one of us and it can get us quick. Materialism, uh, educational pursuits, the home, uh, it's a threat to family. Uh, and maybe even to children that's already left the family and are out on their own. The Bible's not... Ex not not respected like it once was in the home and it's not read and the reason is it's because we just don't have time anymore we don't have time for God to talk to us and sometimes we don't have time to talk to God either and so that relationship gets close and it's because the world and this we, there are just too many things going on in the world we just don't have time for God we don't have time for church we don't have time to teach our children and it's an adversary. It is an enemy of the church. Worldliness is. Fashion replaces spirituality. Eloquence is prefer preferable to truth. Liberalness is prevalent in our society today. Sermons are too long. Hey, why are you doing preaching so long? Don't you know that we don't have about a 10, about a ten minute uh, Attention span, thank you very much. Attention span, that's changed. Entertainment is the big draw today. Worldliness is an enemy of the church. Modernism is an enemy of the church. They say the Bible was written by men. It's full of errors. It's a large social club. They say that there's no hereafter. But... The church will be good for you right now. 
Now, we don't recommend that you leave church alone because it's good to associate with people. Don't have anything to do with heaven. Don't have anything to do with saving. That's modernism. Don't have anything to do with saving your soul. But it's a good place to be. There's good people in church. Go ahead and associate with them. That's modernism. That's an enemy of the church. They are not teaching God's truth. Traditionalism, let me say this about traditionalism because we can get caught up in this. Why are you a member of the church? Well, that's what my daddy and my mama taught me. And that's what their daddy and their mama taught them. And then what's wrong with it? What's wrong with traditionalism? Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. And some of that old time religion wasn't what God said in his book that he wanted us to have. Now, if that old time religion that we like to sing about is the kind that you find in the Bible, that's great. But that's not traditionalism. Old time religion. My parents were good people. And they were in the church. Uh, and that's the reason I'm in the church. It's traditional in the Eden's family. Uh, be careful about traditionalism. That's not the reason that we ought to be here. And here's one that I think is important right here, and that's complacency. Uh, everything's going to be okay. Good people are going to be saved. All religions are good. I saw Oprah Winfrey one afternoon, and I'm sure I've shared this with you before. And she said, All religious people are going to heaven. Uh, and you know how she describes religion? I don't think she just describes it like you've been taught. It doesn't make any difference what God that you believe in as long as you believe in a God. It might be Allah. Uh, it might be one of the Hindu gods, of which they have many. There are many other religions, many of them, as Brother uh, Rehoboam told us, are in India. It doesn't make any difference which one you believe in. That'll be fine. It's complacency. Everything's okay. Religion's good. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the rest of the world. And this is complacency just don't worry about it complacency everything will be okay we've got children in this community that are still not coming to church because their parents won't bring them and their parents don't care whether they come or not and that's complacency but we don't want to ever get in the spot here at Mount Zion where we don't care about people in this community and they don't have to be children that's complacency when we don't care about the souls of other people, that's complacency and that's an enemy of the church. Apathy. I thought that well to put that one in. This reminds me of a little story that Jesus told. He said that there was a man on his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he got waylaid. And they liked to beat him to death. Matter of fact, they said he was half dead. <laughs> What's half dead? Uh, robbed him, took everything he had, and here comes a religious man walking by, and he sees him laying there, and I don't know what comes across his mind. I don't know whether he said, he don't look like a Jew to me. Now this was a priest. This was a priest of the tribe of Levi. Uh, and he looked at him, and he said, it ain't nothing to me. And so he just went on. In a little while, here comes a priest, and now, now a Levite comes by, and essentially he said the same thing. He said, it's nothing right, you know. Uh, maybe if I knew this guy for sure was a Jew, maybe I'd have an obligation, but uh, I don't know that he is, and uh, it's, I didn't do this, and it ain't my fault, so why should I get involved in it? Apathy. Don't care. There are just too many people that don't care. I'm saved, and I can't be bothered with people that's not saved. The church is here, and if people want to come, we got the doors open, and they can come. We like to have everybody that wants to, but now if you think that I'm going to get out here and invite people to church, that ain't my business to do that. 
If they want to come, let them come. If they don't want to come, so what? That's apathy. What if the disciples had just stayed right there at Jerusalem? What if they said, this is where the first gospel sermon was preached. This is where the Jews are that need to be converted to Christianity. There's a lot of work to do right here. and They'll have another Pentecost next year and we'll work on them when they come here from all over the world. But they never had left. What if Peter had never been sent down to uh, the, uh, the centurion? What if he'd never been sent down? What if they'd never went to Antioch? What if Paul had never made a missionary journey? That's, well, that's apathy. We still got it today. And then last of all, we'll wind up with this one right here, stagnancy. You know what stagnancy is? Let me tell you what stagnancy is. This is my definition of stagnancy. Stagnancy is an old pond back here in the field that doesn't have any fresh water running in it. It doesn't have any fresh water running out of it. And it's got about that much old green scum on the top of it. And you wouldn't want to drink it. And that's stagnancy. It's something that just stagnates. It just stays the same. And stagnancy, and it's an enemy of the church, is when nothing new is happening. And that's what's happening to a lot of churches of Christ. And I don't have to reach out any further than that. A lot of churches of Christ, they've just turned, they've got that old green scum all over them. They're not growing, they're not doing nothing. They're just sitting there and they die little by little. And you know, and I know, that there are churches with, almost within hollering distance, that's not churches anymore. Uh, the old people died and they didn't have any young people and it just keeps going that way and it's people that have been members of the church for years good fine people but they stagnated and they didn't tell other people about God's plan of salvation and they just dwindled and died and dwindled and died till there wasn't nothing left and finally somebody said uh, time to shut the door can't pay the electric bill and we'll do something else or do nothing they're still committed to the cause of the Lord but they stagnated and they died and that's an enemy of the church you want to know who's the enemy of the church I didn't get them all this morning but Paul said there's many there's many adversaries and that's some of them right there they, don't, they may not sound threatening to you, but I'm telling you they are there and those are enemies of the church. If you're here this morning and you're outside of Christ, <coughs> Satan pats you on the shoulder and say, not today. Not today. <laughs> Later. Are you going to listen to him? Or are you going to listen to what the Bible says when it says today is the day of salvation? What you going to do while we're staying? Steve, will you lead us in our invitation song? There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you judgment day there's a bright day coming a bright day coming there's a bright day coming by but it's brightness shall only 
Africa to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a sad day coming, a sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by my when the sinner shall hear his doom depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we will sing the first verse of 283. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross, in the cross, be my glory till my raptured soul. about to partake of the Lord's Supper at this time. Got a, just a few verses to read and then we'll partake of, of the Lord's Supper. In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, Jesus is speaking to people that he had just fed at the, the occasion that we come to, they've come to call the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus says to them in verse 26, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He continues on in verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. As we partake of this loaf, let's think about Jesus as that living bread that comes down from heaven that takes away our sins and gives eternal life. Let us pray. Our Father, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus gave of himself, that he became uh, both the high priest and both the, the sacrificial lamb, that he offered his body as atonement to take away our sins. Father, we're thankful for that and for that great gift. And Father, we pray that we'll partake of this loaf in a manner that pleases you and that reminds us of his great sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to continue, I'm going to read just a couple of verses from the book of Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When Jesus died, he bled upon the cross profusely and he bled for our sins to take our sins away. His blood is applied instead of ours that we may have that eternal life, which we talked about before. Once again, let us pray. Father, we are not worthy of the sacrifice of your Son. We have done nothing to, to be worthy of that and could not do anything to be worthy of it. And yet Jesus chose to give his life and to shed his blood to take away our sins. Father, we know that it's his blood that washes away our sins. Father, we're thankful for his sacrifice. We're thankful for the shedding of his blood. And Father, we pray that we'll live our lives in such a way that will please you. And Father, we, we thank you for his great sacrifice for us. Uh, Father, as we partake of this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, we pray that we'll do so in a manner that's pleasing to you, and we'll do so remembering his shed blood. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. As a matter of convenience, uh, the church has chosen at this time to also uh, um, offer a prayer for our offering. And of course, the drop boxes are in the back, and there are many ways that you can make that uh, that offering. I would like to take this opportunity now to pray for our offering today. Father, we return in thanks to you for all the, the things that you bless us with every day. Father, for the, the jobs that we have, the means that we have in which to provide for our families, for ourselves, and Father, to provide for your kingdom. Uh, Father, maybe too often we provide for your kingdom last and we, instead of providing for your kingdom first. But help us to put Jesus uppermost in our mind at this hour and to provide the things back for the church that are needful for its operation and for the spreading of your borders throughout the world. Father, we pray for the church throughout the world, especially our sister congregations in the Ukraine that we've been in communication with. But Father, truly, throughout the world, we pray for the efforts of the church throughout. And Father, we pray for the efforts that are being done to spread your kingdom right here at home in Richardsville. Uh, Father, please forgive us of our sins. Thank you for all that you do and for your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. For our last song today, we'll sing the first and last verse of 628. And after that, we'll ask Connor to dismiss us. And I invite you all to stand. 628, first and last verse. There's a church in the valley by the wild No lovelier spot in the dale. No place is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the wild. Oh, come to the church in the dale. No spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the veil. From the church in the valley by the wildwood wind fades away into night. I would faint from this spot of my childhood, wing my way to the 
mansions of life. Oh, come, 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 come to the church in the wildwood. Oh, come to the church in the van. No body so dear to my child. As the little brown church in the brief meeting now in the fellowship hall for any wishing to help with the Arnold Chandler shower.